Hello Condig, sorry for the abrupt stoppage of the live stream on June 24th. Fortunately, Tyler was nice enough to record his session for us anyway and allow us to share it here on YouTube. So thank you very much, Tyler. We appreciate it. I'm sorry for the technical problems. If you have questions for Tyler and Tyler's content, feel free to leave them here on YouTube or to get a quicker answer, you probably want to contact him uh, based on the information he shared in his presentation. I believe he shared his email address and other things in there. So thank you very much. Uh, again, my apologies, and I hope to see you live next month for Rob Hedgepeth's session on Maui and Xamarin. While you're here, make sure to hit that subscribe button so we can get ourselves a real URL. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, this is Azure Functions, and my name is Tyler Jennings. Uh, so, a little bit about myself before we get started here. Uh, again, my name is Tyler Jennings. I'm a senior consultant at ResultStack, and we are a consulting company uh, based in Knoxville, Tennessee, but we do work all across the United States, uh, actually all across the world. We have uh, some clients in the UK and Australia. Our passion is to you know, help our clients uh, see the, the results of their dreams and to see uh, you know, what they've been desiring so long, you know, to, to really come to fruition, uh, to make them successful. Uh, you know, we work in a lot of different technologies. We work in Azure and AWS, uh, you know, .NET, Node, uh, TypeScript, uh, Elixir. Uh, you know, we, we've done all sorts of stuff. We do work a lot in the uh, transactional space, uh, customer-facing transactions, whether it be retail or restaurants. Uh, we do a lot of restaurant work. Uh, but we've done some, some really big things for uh, a lot of clients and, uh, you know, we'd love to help you out too. So if, if your uh, company or your team is looking for help on your next, next project, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to tell you more about what we do and how we work. Or if uh, you're looking for a change in career and uh, you think consulting sounds fun, getting to do a lot of different things uh, and working on a lot of different projects, uh, a lot of cutting edge stuff, um, or you know, maybe your your company is looking to move back into the office uh, after the pandemic, um, and you'd like to stay remote. Well, we've been a remote first company from the very beginning, uh, you know. So if you're looking for a change, uh, reach out to me. I'd love to uh, you know talk with you, tell you more about you know how we work, and hear about your experience, and uh, you know go from there. Uh, but without further ado. Uh, Tonight, we are going to be discussing Azure Functions. And kind of first off, we have to answer the question, why serverless, uh, right? And uh, there's a lot of good reasons to be using serverless nowadays. So, you know, you have low maintenance. Uh, you don't have to maintain, uh, you know, a lot of VMs or servers and do OS patching or, you know, anything like that. You know, you don't have to manage any any uh, infrastructure like that. And because you don't have to manage infrastructure, it's really easy to set up uh, and really easy to deploy. You don't have to go create a bunch of networks in the cloud or create a bunch of VMs or scaling groups or um, you know, app services. Uh, you know, serverless just really makes it uh, you know, really easy to, to set up an application and deploy it. And uh, another reason is serverless is really easy to scale. I mean, you could set up, you know, VMs and a, uh, an app service, uh, you know, on Azure or, you know, EC2s and Elastic Beanstalk on AWS, uh, and you could set them up to auto scale and do things like that. Uh, but uh, what, you know, some people don't often uh, understand right away is, you know, auto scaling groups and stuff, it takes time to auto scale up, right? Uh, you know, if you have a sudden spike in traffic, uh, you know, and you need to bring another server online, you know, whether you're in Elastic Beanstalk or, or in Azure, you know, it can take, you know, a few minutes or so to, to stand up another server, even in an auto scaling group. So you have to kind of like fine tune that stuff. Whereas serverless is just going to scale, uh, you know, easily, quickly, uh, and automatically. It's, uh, you know, serverless is, is really great for that. So, Okay, you know, serverless sounds like a great way to go. Why Azure? Why, why Azure Functions? Uh, you know, there's several reasons to, to look at Azure Functions. One is there's 
familiar tooling. If you're a .NET developer working in Visual Studio or VS Code, you know, you can use pretty much all the, the same tooling that you do now. Uh, you know, and if you're a .NET developer, you can use a lot of your same, you know, uh, .NET Core libraries and do, you know, .NET Core Azure functions. Uh, a lot of your processes can be the same, you know. Uh, and it's Azure Functions is also a really easy to use and mature platform. I have helped clients uh, within hours uh, create an, an Azure Function app and deploy it and be providing immediate value. It is just that simple to get going with. Uh, so, you know, if you're uh, currently in the .NET space, um, you know, or other languages, it, Azure Functions supports other languages, but you know, if you're looking to make your first foray into serverless uh, computing, Azure Functions provides, uh, you know, a lot of benefits uh, right out the gate. And, uh, you know, it's definitely worth looking at. So the rest of this talk, we're really going to be uh, taking a closer look at Azure Functions, some of the, uh, you know, features that it has, also some of the things to think about uh, or... Uh, you know, some of the ways it contrasts with, say, AWS Lambda, you know, one of the other major competitors out there. Uh, you know, both providers kind of take completely different approaches to how they, you know, approach solving serverless uh, computing. So, uh, you know, let's, let's dive right in. Uh, you know, one of the, the biggest things to kind of grasp right out the gate with Azure Functions is they provide this concept of function apps. And function apps uh, really fills a niche that I would say AWS Lambda, you know, kind of leaves it up to you. Um, and function apps provides a, a single execution context in Azure for which your functions to run. Uh, a function app is comprised of one or more functions and they are managed, scaled, and de uh, deployed together. And that's a key thing to, to think about. Because often when you're wanting to move to microservices, uh, you know, you don't want everything just, you know, spaghetti code, uh, you know, or, or all these separate functions out there. And function apps really provides this, this single app. Like you're building a .NET app, you know, for example. You know, if you're in C Sharp, you have a CS Proj, you've got a project and you can uh, you know, group those functions together and they will be managed and deployed and scaled together. Think about, uh, for instance, a shopping cart. You know, if you're, you're building a microservice, you know, we, Result Stack, we do a lot of stuff in the you know, retail space and shopping carts are kind of a big thing. Well, if you want to change the behavior of a shopping cart, you know, you've got several actions you can do on a shopping cart. You can, you know, create and add stuff to a shopping cart. You can edit stuff in a shopping cart. You can remove stuff from a shopping cart. You can check out that shopping cart. You know, there's a lot of actions you can do with a shopping cart. And if you change some of the behavior, chances are you might need to update more than one function, right? Uh, or, you know, more than one action. And it just makes sense that, you know, there's going to be a collection of functions that really should be managed and, and deployed together and scaled together. You know, if you've, you know, take, for instance, a microservice around shopping carts, uh, you know, if they're, they're scaled together, you know, you're, you're generally going to have the same number of people that are, you know, adding and editing and, and removing stuff from their cart, you know, all together. It makes sense for those to kind of scale together. Um, you know, so I think Azure kind of, uh, takes this nice approach to make microservices easy by providing this this concept of a function app. Now, from there, there's really two types of Azure functions uh, you can talk about. You can you can talk about kind of the stateless, uh, you know, regular Azure functions. You know, these thing these functions you know take in a an input and give back a, an output, and then you know they're done executing. Right. Uh, the other type is called durable functions, and this is an extension to Azure Functions that lets you create stateful workflows. Uh, if you're coming from the AWS world, this is very similar to AWS Step Functions. 
Uh, you know, it, it lets you create these kind of more long running uh, functions that, you know, can hold on to state. Uh, so we're going to take a look at both types tonight, starting out with, you know, kind of the, the regular uh, run of the mill Azure functions. And those functions uh, support many languages. You can do C Sharp, JavaScript, F Sharp, uh, Java, PowerShell, Python, TypeScript. Uh, it is pretty diverse. Uh, you know, it doesn't have, you know, necessarily all your niche languages out there, but, uh, you know, it's got a, a solid offering of languages. Now, uh, different versions of those languages may be supported by different versions of the Azure function runtime. So that's just something to kind of be aware of. Um, you know, but uh, I think one of the things that kind of attracts a lot of people with, with Azure in general is it's a Microsoft ecosystem. So you have, you know, .NET. Uh, now, a big difference between Azure Functions and AWS Lambda is when it comes to concurrency. Uh, Azure Functions uh, has different concurrency plans for the different pricing plans. So if you're on the consumption plan, you're at a max of 200 instances. Uh, and the consumption plan and the premium plan are both great for event-driven workflows. They can scale out automatically, you know, handle, you know, high load. Uh, but you'll also notice the premium plan only supports half of what the uh, consumption plan offers. So it only supports 100 maximum uh, number of instances. This is a far cry from AWS Lambda, where you can scale a Lambda, you know, burst up to 3,000 instances. But the biggest thing to remember here is, uh, going back to that function app concept, is Azure is scaling the entire function app together, whereas on AWS Lambda, it's scaling just that single function. Uh, you know, if you're on the dedicated plan, uh, you can only have a maximum of 10 to 20 instances. Uh, if you're on uh, doing Kubernetes clusters, it kind of depends upon your cluster. So that's something to, to look at there. Uh, so do be aware that there is this kind of ceiling at 200 uh, concurrent instances of your function app. If you're needing higher than that, which that's, uh, you know, decently high, but if you're needing higher than that, then you, you'll probably want to look at like, uh, you know, a web app, API, something that you can scale, uh, you know, higher. Now, do be aware, though, that you can control your dynamic scaling. So you can say, you know, I want to put a limit on this. I want to say, while I could have 200 concurrent instances, I want to cap it at, say, 50 or 10 or 1. You know, maybe you have something that only needs to run once. And that's... Uh, you know, something to think about, you know, especially as you're building out uh, applications using the Azure ecosystem, you need to consider the uh, plans and r limits on your other Azure services. So if you consider, for example, Azure SQL Server, if you have the lowest tier Azure SQL Server, you are limited to, I think, 60 requests, in-flight requests at a time. Not 60 connections to the database, but 60 uh, concurrent requests. So if you consider that you have an Azure function it can, and it could have, you know, some sudden spike of traffic, whether it's, you know, HTTP or, you know, maybe it's processing a queue, uh, you know, it's pulling stuff off a queue, a bunch of stuff gets dumped into the queue. You don't want your Azure function to, you know, scale up to 200 if your database can't handle it, you know, uh, so you know, as you're building your applications, kind of think about, well, how does, you know, the concurrency of my Azure function fit in with my other uh, Azure services? You know, the last thing you want to see is a bunch of, you know, exceptions in your error log and, and monitoring because you exceeded the, the rate of, say, your database or, or some other service. Um, you know, so think about, uh, you know, concurrency for your function apps. Uh, and think about your other Azure services and how they kind of fit in to the, the puzzle pieces of your, your function app concurrent-wise. Uh, now, probably my favorite thing about Azure Functions is the triggers. Uh, Azure Functions makes it so easy 
uh, to specify how should your function be invoked, uh, right? So, uh, you know, it supports many different types of triggers or, or uh, types of invocations. So you could do an HTTP trigger. So maybe you're building out an API, um, you know, or needing to create some webhooks for an integration. You know, HTTP trigger is probably the most common used trigger. Uh, there's also blob storage triggers, so you could trigger a function when a file is uploaded or changed in blob storage, or when a document is created or updated in Cosmos DB, or you could respond to events in Azure Event Grid, or Event Hubs, or respond to data in the IoT Hub, or con uh, consume messages from Kafka, or Azure Q Storage, or RabbitMQ, or Service Bus, you know, Azure Service Bus queues. You know, it, it's, I think it's kind of funny that Azure provides like a ton of kind of redundant services, right? But they all have different features. Take, for example, uh, you know, Azure uh, Storage, uh, you can do queues, you know, queues off of Azure Storage. Uh, you can also do queues in Azure Service Bus. You know, they behave differently. Uh, Azure Queue Storage, you can specify infinite lifetimes on the items in your queues. You know, Azure Service Bus does not. Um, you know, or RabbitMQ or, you know, Kafka, you know, any of these. There's, uh, you know, there's kind of a lot of overlap between Azure services, but they each have their own features, and you can trigger Azure functions based off of, you know, all these services plus more. This is really just a subset of uh, the types of triggers that they offer. Um, I'll have a link at the end where you can go, you know, look at all the other triggers that they offer. The last trigger there I, I have listed is a timer trigger. And uh, I find this one uh, really awesome because, you know, maybe in the olden days you would create a Windows service to run on a server somewhere to do batch processing and cron jobs and stuff like that. Uh, well, now you can just create an Azure function and put a timer trigger on it and say, I want it to run every, you know, 15 minutes, or I want it to run on Sundays at, you know, 3 a.m. Uh, or the first day of the month, uh, you know, whatever. You can you can specify some pretty elaborate cron jobs and, uh, you know, really uh, replace, you know, a lot of things you might have done Windows services for. So let's take a look at... Uh, you know, some of the triggers and how they look in code. So uh, on the screen, we have an example of uh, an HTTP trigger. So we have a, an attribute called function name on our function uh, that gives it the name get delivery fee. And then uh, our method uh, is asynchronous, uh, with a, returns a task of an HTTP response message. You could also return an I action result, just like you know, normal web APIs. Uh, and then inside our method signature, we have this, you know, attribute with HTTP trigger. And we can specify the authorization level. We can say, you know, this can do a get and a post. We can specify that, you know, the, the route that this function should be, should be triggered off of. And then we have our HTTP request uh, parameter and our iLogger. So... Uh, triggers are really as simple as putting this attribute inside your your method and uh, you know that will specify this function now will be invoked based on you know these rules uh, so it's just super simple and you can take a function app and you can mix and match your triggers uh, on your functions in that function app and uh, you know really do some some neat stuff uh, you know here's an example of a function uh, called resize image that will trigger off a blob trigger. Specifically, it will trigger off the container menu-images. Uh, and then with the uh, name as the next parameter. And then it'll look specifically inside that container at the blob menu item images md. So, you know, you can create blob triggers that are pretty robust and, uh, you know, only trigger based on you know certain blobs in a certain container. Uh, you'll notice there that in the attribute we actually have the uh, uh, connection for the Azure storage uh, account, and uh, you know that name there, storage connection app settings. You know that is just an environment variable. It'll go pull the the value out of uh, you know the configuration of the function app. 
Now, do note that blob triggers are really a best effort. So blobs, blob triggers are scanning essentially the, the logs of what's happening on uh, you know, the blob storage account and uh, you know, we'll pick stuff up as it comes in and take care of it. However, you know, it's best effort. So if you have a ton of stuff that, are, that is suddenly written to the container, then that blob trigger might miss something. So if you need faster or more reliable blob processing, look at using a queue trigger or an event grid message instead. And speaking of event grid messages, you know, again, you can just change out your trigger and say, well, this is an event grid trigger. And the type of the parameter is an event grid event. And then you can deserialize the data off of that uh, as your payload. So changing from a blob trigger to an event grid trigger is, you know, really easy to do. And also uh, queues. So if, here we have a function called process queue that has a queue trigger. This is an Azure storage queue trigger. And you can specify the queue name in there and the, uh, you know, app setting uh, environment variable for your storage account. And then we have, uh, in this case, we have a type called record for our queue item, and that is a custom type that uh, class that we've created. Uh, so if you've used uh, Azure queue, uh, queue storage, or maybe you haven't, you know, when you put something on an Azure uh, storage queue, you have to base64 encode it. However, when your Azure function reads off that queue, it'll automatically decode it uh, and cast it to uh, the type that you specify. So you don't have to decode that manually. So then we, you can just bring in the queue item and, uh, you know, in this case, we might write it to a database uh, or, or do something else with it. Uh, you know, so that's kind of several examples of the uh, uh, Azure function triggers. There's a lot of different triggers out there. You know, again, I'll have a link at the end. You can kind of take a look at all the different things that they offer. Now, if you are new to uh, working in serverless in general, this is not specific for Azure. Uh, you know, AWS, you know, pretty much every provider has this, this concept of a cold start. And that is when your function hasn't been invoked in a while, there can be some latency on that next uh, invocation. So, you know, it's kind of like the old days if you've managed IIS yourself, you know, it can kind of go to sleep and then, you know, that next, uh, you know, invocation, it's got to kind of warm up and there's some latency uh, to getting a response. Well, serverless functions uh, have that same problem. If your uh, function hasn't been executed in a while, uh, or in this case for Azure, your function app hasn't been executed in a while, you know, there could be some latency. Uh, so, how do you handle that? Uh, you know, well, Azure takes a very different approach to this than AWS. On AWS, you might set a property called provision concurrency to keep your, your Lambda you know, perpetually warm. You can say, I want to keep five instances of this Lambda perpetually warm. Azure says, well, you know what? We're going to solve it first with pricing plan. So, if you're on the consumption plan, that which is the lowest plan, you have to deal with cold starts yourself. And we're going to take a look at how to do that in just a minute. Uh, but if you're on the premium plan, then Azure will keep your instances perpetually warm. So you don't have to, uh, you know, have a cold start. You completely avoid it altogether. You know, that's kind of going back to the big difference between the premium plan and the consumption plan. Premium plan only allows you to have 100 max instances, whereas the consumption plan, you could have double that. You could have 200 but the premium plan is going to keep those instances warm for you so you don't have any cold start issues. If you're on the dedicated plan, then uh, your functions are running continuously. You know, but remember you're capped at you know, 10 to 20 <laughs> instances. Uh, and then if you're on uh, Kubernetes, uh, just be aware that if you allow your Kubernetes cluster to scale down to zero, you're going to have to deal with cold starts. But if you just keep that scale at at least one, then on Kubernetes, you're not going to have any cold start issues. So 
on the consumption plan, how do you deal with uh, cold starts? Well, the most common solution that I see out there is to add a function to your function app called a function warmer. And this function warmer does absolutely nothing. You don't have any code in there uh, for it to execute. Uh, you just put a timer trigger on that function to say, run every 15 minutes. Don't do anything, but run every 15 minutes. And because Azure has function apps where everything is scaled, you know, deployed and scaled together, this one function will keep your entire function app warm and ready to go, and you never have to deal with a cold start. Now, technically, you do have the kind of the overhead of paying for a function that's running every 15 minutes. That's doing absolutely nothing, so the execution time is pretty much, you know, it, you know, nothing pretty much, but. Uh, you know, there, there is a, you know, slight cost associated to that. So that's kind of uh, Azure Functions in a nutshell. Uh, one of the things we want to look at next is uh, durable functions. So, you know, normal Azure Functions, you may, build a, may be building out an API, you may be dealing with queue storage, you may be uh, responding to event grid messages or, you know, other, some other messaging system or queuing system uh, or timers. You have cron jobs. Uh, durable functions uh, is an extension onto all of that and lets you create stateful workflows. So, uh, you know, do note that since this is an extension of Azure Functions, it doesn't support quite all the languages that Azure Functions supports. It only supports C Sharp, JavaScript, Python, F Sharp, and PowerShell. Sorry, no Java or TypeScript. Uh, you know, TypeScript being a Microsoft language, I you know really hope they add that support soon uh, to, to durable functions. But you know, in what use cases would you use durable functions? Well, the common patterns that uh, you know, are often used in, in uh, you know, Microsoft even really helps, you know, people out on this by providing a, a lot of documentation and examples of this kind of thing. Uh, you know, there's such things as function chaining where, uh, you know, you're passing values from one function, you know, on down. There's fan out, fan in. There's asynchronous HTTP APIs, uh, monitoring for, you know, certain uh, events and responding to it. Uh, human interaction events where, you know, you need, you know, you've automated the majority of a process, but you need, you know, somebody to kind of manually interact with it at some point. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you know, aggregating stateful entities where you're kind of building up a, uh, a single entity. Now let's take a brief look at each one of these. Uh, the first one, function chaining. So, uh, here we have uh, an example. We still have our function name attribute, uh, but then you'll notice our trigger is now an orchestration trigger, and our parameter is an I durable orchestration context. These are unique to uh, durable functions. So, uh, an orchestration trigger is uh, you know this is specifying this is a durable function, and then your I durable orchestration context is providing you the context in which you know, this long running process is going to run. It provides you a lot of methods uh, that can help you build out uh, a lot of different workflows. In this case, uh, we're going to use that context, that iDurable orchestration context, to call other activities. And activities are Azure functions with a special trigger type that can be used by durable functions. So in this case, uh, we're going to call an activity, another Azure function called validate order, and we're going to get that response, and we're going to pass that response to process payment, and get that response, and then pass that response to inject order. Uh, and then lastly, uh, pass the response to email confirmation. So we're kind of chaining a bunch of functions together in a synchronous manner. Uh, you know, we're just going down the pipeline, passing uh, the response object uh, the whole way down. Now, this is a very contrived uh, simplified uh, example, uh, but you know the point is that you know you can use this durable function context to then kind of create this chain of a workflow here. Now the you know 
this is calling call activity async on the context, uh, and then we're giving it a string of the uh, function. And uh, the function app itself will look in the available functions and see, okay, yeah, we have validate order, and uh, you know it is an activity trigger here. And you know, we have that activity trigger saying, this is an activity of a durable function. It can pass, you can pass in whatever parameters you want and you know, get a whatever response you want. Uh, the next example is fan out, fan in. And in this case, the durable function is going to take its context, call an activity, get a, you know, a collection of stuff, and then iterate over that concurrently. And then at the end, aggregate all the responses before moving on. So uh, here we have another function with an orchestration trigger again, an iDurable orchestration context. And then we get a list of orders there by calling the activity retrieve orders function. We loop over the, the orders, call an activity process order, but we don't await uh, for that response. We just add the task to our parallel tasks, and then we're going to wait for all of them at the end, and then aggregate the results, and then call the activity notify order response. So you may be getting the, uh, the idea here that Durable functions really gives you the tools, this orchestration trigger and iDurable orchestration context, and then it lets you build out uh, and write the code for all the different uh, types of workflows that you can dream of, really. Uh, you know, so it's a very code-oriented approach. Uh, the next example is asynchronous HTTP APIs. I don't have slides for this one just because I feel like it becomes quite a bit of code and you know it's harder to show uh, on slides. But the general gist is you have an HTTP uh, function that takes a request and starts some long-running process and then goes ahead and returns a response to the consumer saying, okay, here's the job ID and here's how to check the status of it. There's another function involved that uh, the consumer can then hit to check the status of that long-running job. So it's a very asynchronous workflow, uh, you know. And this is great because, you know, a lot of load balancers can't support, you know, long-running uh, HTTP requests. So this is a way to create this asynchronous workflow instead. Uh, you know, for example, uh, a, a good example of this would be a checkout process. You know, on a checkout process, there's a lot of things that have to happen, some of which uh, can be slower than you would like, you know, such as, okay, you take in an order, you validate it, that's quickly, um, and then you can process payment, that's pretty quick, but in uh, a distributed environment where you've got to get that order down to a specific store, like for a restaurant, you've got to get the you may be taking that order in the cloud, but that's got to get to the kitchen of the store. And if that store has really bad internet, you know, sometimes that process can be a little bit slower than you would like. So in this case, you could actually make the whole thing asynchronous. Submit the order, check out, you know, start the checkout process, return to the, the client. Okay, this is, you know, this process has started. And then it can pull for updates, you know, you know, very quickly. You know, you could do it, you know, even once a second. It's like, okay, you can get status updates. It's, you know, processing payment. It's, uh, you know, validated. It's, you know, getting sent to the kitchen, etc. So you can provide, you know, the this feedback to the customer, uh, so that you know they're just not watching a spinning wheel. Uh, you know, that would be a good use case uh, for this kind of thing. Uh, the next example is using durable functions to monitor some process. So here we have a, an orchestration trigger with an iDurable orchestration context. The first thing we're going to do is get the input off the context, get the job ID, and we're going to then retrieve what is our polling interval and what is our expiration time. And then we're going to enter a while loop. While the current date time is less than the expiration time, we're going to call the activity get job status. If that job status is completed, then we're going to send, you know, call an activity to send some alert and break out of that while loop. But if it's not completed, 
then we will calculate what is our next check time. We're gonna take it the current date time and add whatever our pulling interval is to it. And then we're gonna use our context to create a timer and wait for that timer. Uh, so then we're not gonna you know, execute the next iteration of the while loop until that timer goes off. Uh, so again, this is another example where the iDurable orchestration context gives you these tools. You know, you can get you know the input off the context. You can call other activities to you know perform actions. Uh, you can create timers. Uh, you know, we're going to see another one in, in the next example too as well. This context really provides you a robust set of tools to to do uh, some pretty neat things. Uh, this next example is human interaction. And so in this example, we're going to call an activity that's going to request an approval. So say for an example, we have automated, uh, you know, time card, uh, you know, uh, time, time card reports, you know, people are clocking in in the restaurants and, you know, we're, you know, collecting that data, we're generating a report. We send that report to HR or accounting, whoever it needs to go to, and we request for that to be approved through this activity. We then uh, will create a due time, which is taking the current date time, in this case, adding on 72 hours, and we're gonna create a timer for that. And that's gonna be our timeout. And then we're going to use our context to wait for an external event for our approval event. Again, this is another another function. And then in our if statement, we're gonna say is our approval event, we're gonna then wait for either our timeout or our approval event to come back. If we get the approval event, we cancel the timeout and we call an activity to process the approval. So then, you know, in the example for doing time card reports, we then Take that time card report and you know send it you know through an integration into whatever you know uh, you know payment processor or HR system that they have. Uh, but if we don't get the approval event, then in the else block of this function, we would escalate uh, you know through another activity, which may you know reach out to somebody else, uh, send emails, make you know uh, initiate SMS messages or or pagers or whatever. So you can create these kind of complex uh, workflows that can uh, require human interaction in order to complete. The last example that we're going to look at uh, here is the aggregator or the, you know, dealing with stateful entities. And in this example, uh, instead of a orchestration trigger, we have an entity trigger. Instead of a iDurable orchestration context, we have an iDurable entity context. And what this context allows you to do in this trigger is you can uh, retrieve whatever the current value of this uh, entity is. And the context can also provide an operation or an action. So you, in this case, we have three operations we can add reset or get. If we add, we're going to get the current input the get off the context, and then we're going to add it to the current value and set new context state. If we enter the reset branch, we're going to set the state back to zero, and in the get branch, we will return the current value on the context. So uh, you know, a entity trigger really can give you a robust set of tools for, you know, building this, uh, you know, single data object up that, you know, could be uh, having a lot of uh, inputs from, you know, various places. Uh, so uh, the entity trigger and the entity context is uh, a really neat uh, offering in the durable functions space. Now, one thing you could be asking is, okay, durable functions provides, uh, you know, some really cool things here. And except for the uh, asynchronous HTTP, eyes, HTTP APIs, there's the question of how do we invoke these, right? Uh, you know, what is an orchestration trigger? Well, 
you can invoke durable functions from other Azure functions, right? With this uh, durable client. And so if you pass in a durable client to any other Azure function, you can invoke a durable function. So that means you could invoke a durable function from a queue trigger or an HTTP trigger or uh, you know event grid trigger, blob storage trigger, uh, you know any number of triggers. Uh, it's it's really robust. You can really do uh, you know a lot of uh, you know mix and match these you know normal Azure functions and triggers with durable functions and create some some pretty powerful workflows. Now, as an example, right, you know, we're, we're looking at Azure Functions. Durable Functions is obviously a very code heavy approach. You know, they give you these uh, interfaces and these triggers, and then you have to code everything together yourself. In AWS, uh, AWS has step functions, which is a very config oriented approach. And you build a state machine in JSON or YAML and you can do all your, you know, parallel processing and try catches and all that in the, you know, JSON of your state machine. So here's just a, kind of an example to show uh, as a comparison. We have a state machine that's going to take an order and check, okay, is this order from DoorDash or Uber Eats? And then translate that order appropriately and then come into a single function for inject into POS and then kind of fan back out whether it's a whether it's a DoorDash or an Uber Eats order and notify the appropriate party that that order has been received and processed. So uh, AWS takes a very different approach to this. Uh, you know, Azure Functions and Durable Functions uh, really gives you a set of interfaces, attributes, and stuff like that, and expects you to kind of build out whatever workflow. Uh, you know, you, you need. So, quick recap. Uh, Azure has this concept of function apps, which is uh, you know, really great for building essentially a cohesive app that's going to be built, scaled, deployed together. Uh, AWS doesn't have that concept. What AWS has instead is a, a concept called layers which lets you provide, you know, essentially libraries and packages across your, your Lambda functions. Uh, so, you know, two very different approaches there. Azure functions, I feel like, you know, really uh, come with, uh, you know, a lot of built-in tools to help you do microservices, you know, easy, the easy way, right? Uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily build out, you know, all the, uh, you know, how you might, deploy and all that your, yourself, you know, it's going to kind of come built in. Azure Durable Functions provides a very code-oriented approach to building stateful workflows, uh, whereas AWS Step Functions provides a very config-oriented approach uh, for uh, stateful workflows. Azure Functions can only scale up to 200 concurrent instances, uh, and that's on the consumption plan. And AWS Lambda can burst up to 3,000 concurrent instances. Uh, but again, it's, you know, a difference that kind of goes back to, you know, the foundation here where Azure has, you know, these function apps and you're scaling an entire function app, not just a single function. Um, you know, so very different approaches, uh, but, uh, you know, they both offer some, some uh, neat offerings. Uh, but yeah, very different approaches to the serverless space. Now, if you're looking to get into Azure Functions, I highly recommend installing the VS Code extension, Azure Tools. Uh, this provides you a set of tools in VS Code to interact with Azure Functions and many other Azure services. So highly recommend installing that. And then it is super easy to get started with Azure Functions. Once you have that extension installed, you could press F1 to you know, bring up the menu, type in Azure Functions, and say, create new project. 
And from there, it prompts you, okay, what language do you want? Do you want C Sharp, JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, Java, PowerShell, etc.? You know, C Sharp sounds good. We'll go with that. Uh, which version of .NET uh, do we want? Do we want .NET Core uh, 3 LTS, which is, you know, I think end of life near the end of 2022, or .NET 5, which I think is end of life in February, you know. So, you know, kind of keep that in mind as well. Uh, we'll go with the LTS. And then uh, what kind of trigger do we want to start out with? You know, for our first function, you know, let's just go here with the HTTP trigger. Let's give our function a name. Let's create a namespace. Uh, we'll do result stack dot functions. Uh, what access rights do we want on our function? So here we could do anonymous, so it's wide open to everybody. We could do function, we could do admin, you know, we, we could scope it to some sort of authentication or authorization mechanism. Uh, we'll go with anonymous for now. Uh, and then do we want to open our project in the current window or a new window? Yeah, we'll go with current window. And literally, uh, you know, in less than 60 seconds, you can have a an Azure function app created uh, here in, with a, you know, essentially hello world HTTP trigger function. And then to deploy, it's super simple. We open back up the Azure tools uh, extension on the left hand side. We go to functions. We can click and build and then click deploy. So we can deploy that function app right there. It'll prompt you if you're logged in, which function app do you want to deploy to? Or do you want to create a new one? Uh, you know, or if you need to create a new one, you know, create resource groups, etc. It walks you through it. You can literally, you know, from start to finish, create a function app, write your logic, and have it deployed in, in minutes. Um, you know, uh, again, there is, uh, you know, a client that, you know, we had, you know, their first function app built and deployed in less than a day, uh, providing real value, uh, you know, for the client. So super simple to get started. Uh, you know, you can also integrate it with, you know, all your CI CD pipelines. But if you're just wanting to play around, the Azure tools extension in, in VS Code makes it super, super uh, simple. Uh, now, something else that uh, you may want to consider is using serverless framework. This is not a Microsoft tool. This is an open source library. They also offer a paid offering. Uh, but the open source library is, is really great. You can consider it kind of like the Terraform uh, of the serverless space. So you can write your functions in a more or less uh, cloud agnostic way. Uh, and then you have a YAML file or a JSON file to specify which cloud provider are you using and how should you wire up your functions. Uh, I've used this before on uh, production projects, and it's just really easy. Um, you know, it, it's worth checking out as well. So you can you can do some really cool stuff. You can do pretty much all the same things, but you know, if your company is one of those that's like, we don't want to be locked into a single vendor, and you know you always have to kind of conform to a vendor to some extent, right? But you can minimize that. And serverless framework can provide kind of a way to do that. Uh, so uh, check it out. Uh, I'm in no way affiliated with them. I've just used serverless framework and uh, have enjoyed it in the past. Um, so uh, I've got a few links here, not many. Uh, the first one is on durable functions, just to kind of do some more reading up on that. The uh, second link is uh, all the C sharp triggers uh, for Azure functions. There's you know a lot more than what I showed here. It's worth looking at. And then the last link, serverless.com for serverless framework. Finally, uh, if you have questions, uh, you can reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn at uh, Tyler C. Jennings, or you can email me at tylerj at resultstack.com. Um, I also have my personal email on the screen, jenningstcj at gmail. Uh, you know, if you have questions about, you know, 
serverless in general or Azure Functions uh, or AWS Lambdas, uh, you know, reach out to me. I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions. Uh, or, you know, if your team is needing help on your next project, uh, you know, migrating to the cloud uh, or, uh, you know, building out uh, an application or whatever, uh, you know, reach out to me. If you're looking for a new job, we are hiring at Result Stack. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'd be glad to, to talk to you. So, uh, we are a fully remote company. Uh, you know, we're not going to be going back into an office. Uh, we've been remote first. So, uh, you know, if you're uh, you know, looking for the next step in your career and you think consulting sounds fun, uh, I'd love to hear from you. And the last link there, tiny URL, uh, rs-azure-functions is the link to these slides. So if you enjoyed this presentation and... Um, you know, you got something out of it, you can access the slides, uh, you know, reach out to me if you have any questions again. Uh, and again, thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to me, and uh, I hope you found this useful and beneficial. Thanks.